A lot has been made about Raheem Morris's variation of the Fangio defense for our Rams. We're going to work to make some sense of it today. Originally, I was not a fan, but the 2022 season changed my mind. Let's take a look at it a little closer through the numbers. So for the first half of our season, really except for the Buffalo game, our defense only gave up somewhere between about 12 and 16 points a game. So we're looking at the schedule right now, and you can see the point totals that don't always reflect that overall. But we're talking about the total points that our defense gave up. We're not talking about points given up on defensive touchdowns, on pick sixes. I don't even personally count touchdowns that we give up when we fumbled the ball deep in our own territory and the opponent only had to go 15 yards to score. So on top of our defense only giving up in the teens amount of points per game, our offense was by far the worst since Jeff Fisher was in charge of it. When you have Sean McVay, who I would argue is maybe the greatest coach since Bill Walsh in terms of how he changed both offense and defense around the league. We have to think that his offense has permeated the league through Matt LaFleur and Arthur Smith by extension there, Zach Taylor, Kevin O'Connell, Thomas Brown, and that's just his branch of the Shanahan tree. Shanahan's tree is also growing in its own with Mike McDaniel and how he just brought in Mike LaFleur. So we can very quickly see a very large percentage of the league running this offense. And I would say it's more so because of what Sean McVay did back in 2018 and 2019 than the last couple of years where Kyle Shanahan's branch has started to emerge. We also have to remember that his offense changed how defense is played through the league from back in that first Super Bowl season and the following season thereafter when Vic Fangio really shut down our offense. And now we see Fangio's defense taking over the league to the point where McVay even brought somebody from Fangio's system in to teach the defense to him so he could beat it. So again, I'm not saying he's a, you know, greater than Bill Belichick, but when we think about how one coach has changed the league, I can't think of anybody who has changed it more probably since Bill Walsh when he really brought the West Coast offense in vogue. So when you have that coach, you need to be able to score 20 points on a bad day. Also remember that these first games in the season we're looking at are before anybody else was injured outside of our offensive line, and these are still the point totals that we were putting up. So I want to look at our record from last season a little bit differently. Um, I know it's easy to cherry pick kind of the things that you like and the things you don't, but we're going to look at two different variables that if we take them away can very greatly change the outlook of our season. And they're not two variables that are hard to ask for. And no, one of them is not the injury bug. The two variables we're going to look at is if we could score 20 points, at least 20 points, and not give up non-offensive touchdowns to our opponents. If we do both of those things, our season looks very, very different. So we're going to go game by game and see our record. Now those two variables, those two extra parameters would not change our first three weeks of the season. We would still be 2-1 and one going to San Francisco. So in week four at San Francisco, if we do not throw a pick six and we score 20 points, we win that game. The next week against Dallas, if we don't fumble in what would be Dallas' red zone and we score 20 points, we win that game. We beat Carolina. So now... Instead of three and three, we're going into our bye five and one with San Francisco coming home on the other side of it. San Francisco would beat us even if we scored 20 points. If we scored 20 points, we beat Tampa Bay. Without the fumble in our own red zone against Arizona and with 20 points, we're at least going to overtime tied at 20. So we'll call that a tie. So through our week 10 game against Arizona at home, we are right now, we are 6-2-1. and one. The Saints do beat us with our parameters here. Against the Chiefs, if we score 20 points and we don't throw interceptions on back-to-back -back offensive plays in our own territory, we are at least taking the Chiefs to overtime as well, tied at 20. 
Again, we'll call it a tie. So we are 6-3-2 and two going into December. The rest of the season would have played out the way that it did with our new parameters with two losses to Seattle and Green Bay and the Chargers and with wins over the Raiders and the Broncos. But our overall season would have finished at 8-7-2. and two. And again, the only two changes I gave to our season were if we could score 20 points and if we did not give up non-offensive touchdowns to our opponent. Two things that I don't think are too much to ask for. Also remember that neither of those include accounting for the injuries that we suffered in either scenario. So we look at the conference standings. The Seahawks are the seven seed at nine and eight. Because they had the tiebreaker over us with the season sweep, we would have had to win both overtime games to actually make the playoffs. But either way, even in a worst case scenario, if we lost both of our overtime games and we finished eight and nine, that is a far cry from being 5-12, and 12. and even with the losses that we've sustained this offseason, I think our outlook from the media for our 2023 season is much different. Also keep in mind that our two games against the Seahawks, we only lost by a combined 7 points, and in neither game did any of our three pillar players play in Stafford, Cup, and Donald. So I say that to demonstrate these two things. Number one, this team is much better than it's being given credit for. Or at least we're closer to the average to good range than we are to the bottom five of the league, in my opinion. Pundits like to use records in one-score games when there are outliers, but I don't think that those same media members are factoring in the injury outlier. Again, not claiming that I think we'll be in Super Bowl contention, but I think with a decent draft and a relatively healthy season, we should definitely be in the playoff mix in December. Number two, and where this point's really going to drive home in this video, is the offense is what lost us most of these games. So for all the hate that Raheem Morris's version of this defense has gotten, I don't think it's deserved, and we're going to talk about why by talking about one of the most controversial games of this season, the Tampa Bay game. So we're going to start here by looking at how we would defend the run. This is what we would call the penny front. Penny front means we have five Defensive linemen, if you will, we've got our three true defensive linemen and our two outside linebackers. Then we have one inside linebacker. Our defensive line is playing what we call a gap and a half technique, which means they have a primary gap, and then they will fall back to their secondary gap. And then we are forcing the run with our outside linebackers. The inside linebacker, because the gaps are really accounted for by the front, he gets to take his time and really make a read and fit off of the running back. So let's see how this plays out. All right, we are in man coverage, and we'll go back and look at the coverage from this play after we talk about the front right here. Because we're in man coverage, the outside linebacker is going to chase the running back across the field because he sees him crossing the field and he is not responsible for the C-gap because our defensive end is rocking out to the C-gap. The safety's man is the tight end, and safety's rules for blocking tight ends is that when the tight end gets involved in the run game, you have to get involved in the run game as well. So you can see Rap coming down here to fit the box whenever the tight end gets hands on the outside linebacker. Again, because all our gaps are accounted for by stealing them up front with our defensive linemen, Bobby Wagner does not have to jump in on the run fit yet. Look at his eyes. He is looking at the receiver. Uh, he's what we would call the rat player that we'll talk about, uh, but he is looking to cut any crossing routes. And right now, it looks like Godwin could be crossing. We'll find out that he's coming to crack block on Wagner here, uh, but Wagner is doing his job looking for his crossers first, and then he will have time to fit the run. So we got our one-on-one -on -one here with Aaron Donald. And because he's got the one-on-one -on -one while everybody else is two-on-two, -two, he's got a two-way go. Look at his eyes. He's looking at Fournette right here. Fournette's kind of threatening Aaron Donald's left gap there. And then when Fournette crosses his face, Aaron Donald, he will shuck off the offensive lineman here. Our outside linebacker has set the edge, and we pop out, and there's nowhere for the running back to go. We swallow it up. 
ends up being about a three-yard gain, which is a little bit less than the offense wants to get. All right, so let's talk about the coverage behind this run play. One of the things that's very important with the system that we run, the Fangio system, is the marriage between the front and the coverage. So the front is our defensive line and our linebackers. Then our coverage is our secondary, our corners, our safeties, and then our, how our linebackers get involved there. Our linebackers are very important to both, and that's why it's very important to understand the marriage between the two. So again, we see our penny front, five down players, and one linebacker. We have our two high shell. This is uh, one of the signatures of the Fangio defense is pre-snap to high shell and then rotating to our coverage. We do have a man indicator down here to the X receiver because Jalen Ramsey is pressed on him, and this is a man coverage here. So now we take that two high shell that we presented and we have post-snap rotated to a one high man coverage. This is what we would call one lurk. Lurk means that the middle linebacker is playing the rat. Again, the rat means he is looking to take the first crosser across the field. This is how we would defend a lot of the things like Tyreek Hill did in Kansas City, is you get somebody on the inside to take that crossing route, and then now the person who was man on that receiver will become the new rat in the hole. So one lurk means that the middle linebacker is going to play that rat technique. One robber means that the weak safety is going to play that rat technique. And then one hole means that the strong safety is going to play that rat technique. And based on who plays that rat, so if one of the safeties is playing it, then the other safety rotates to the middle of the field, then the middle linebacker would have whoever that receiver was. So in this case, our corner up top has number one, the nickel has number two, and our safety has rotated down to be man on number three, who was the tight end. Remember, we see the tight end getting involved in the block. That's when Rapp is coming down to be that extra fitter. Floyd was man on the running back. That's why you can see him chasing him across the field over here. He's not responsible for the C-gap over here. He is responsible for the man. And then down low, we've got Jalen Ramsey on Mike Evans. So this would be a one high coverage. We don't get to see it play out as far as a pass play goes, but we can tell that even on the run, this is man coverage. We also have our two high safety alignment. The reason we do this is because the quarterback doesn't know the coverage pre-snap. If you're already rotated to one high, it's much easier for the quarterback to tell that it's going to be either some variation of cover three or cover one. And we probably know who the strong safety is going to be on or who's going to be that inserting player to the box. Right now, the quarterback doesn't know that. And this helps in two scenarios, really. Number one, this helps on the bootleg play action pass whenever the quarterback has to turn his back from under center. And so he sees too high pre-snap. And by the time he gets his eyes back around after faking the handoff, the coverage has completely changed. Also think about it in the gun right here. Quarterback has to actually look at the ball until he catches it or he's not going to catch it. Doesn't matter how many reps you have, you can't always guarantee that ball is going to be 100% in the same place every time. So the quarterback has to take his eyes just for half a second, watch the ball being snapped, and by that time whenever he looks up, the co by that time whenever he looks up, the contour of the coverage has changed. So right now we're too high. Post snap, we are one high. This is our version of cover three, which we call cover nine. Cover three means we're going to rotate to the passing strength. Cover nine means we're going to rotate the safety down that is away from the passing strength. This would be cover nine in the Fangio system. So we've got our three deep third players with our two corners and then our strong safety rotating to the middle of the field. We have our curl flat players with our nickel to the passing strength and our will away from the passing strength. Then we have our two hook players with our middle linebacker and then our rotating down weak safety. So it's important to note that our 
curl flat players are curl to the flat. Something has to bring them to the flat. They aren't just going to run there right away. That's why we see Troy Hill right here just hanging out in the curl because he doesn't have a reason to go to the flat yet. We'll see uh, Leonard Fournette flare out out of the backfield here, and then we'll see Troy Hill widen out to cover the flat. We also see up top we've got hands on the receiver running out. There's nothing else out there. There's no reason for him to just go straight there. We don't want to cover grass. We want to cover receivers. Again, this would be cover nine, rotating to three deep zone away from our nickel. All right, and this is the goal of the defense. We play that coverage shell because we want to force the short throws, rally, and make the tackle. The whole goal of our defense is to have non-explosive pass plays. One explosive pass play on a drive doubles or triples the likelihood that the offense is going to score on that drive. So what we want to do is force the defense back to the huddle. That's a saying we have in high school a lot. We want to make the defense take as many plays as possible to score. No cheap touchdowns. That's why we went out and got Matt Stafford, because Sean McVay was tired of having to have these 12, 13, 14, 18 play drives with Jared Goff because we didn't have the skill to get those cheap touchdowns. So when we got Stafford, we had somebody who could air it out and throw it over the defense and get our cheap touchdowns. You saw that on the third offensive play, I believe it was, of our Super Bowl season when he threw that play action pass to Van Jefferson. We play this deep shell because we want to keep everything in front of our defense. We want to make them throw it short. We'll come up and make the tackle, and we'll play the next play. This is why we struggle against San Francisco, because they have George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, who are all known for getting yards after the catch. They're slippery when they get the ball in their hands, a lot more slippery than almost every other player in the league, and they're all on one team. So San Francisco's just fine to throw it short and let their receivers do the work, whereas most teams are not, as we can see here. Again, we see our signature coverage cushion. Our closest defender is seven yards off. This is also part of the reason that we traded Jalen Ramsey, because this system is not demanding on secondary players. Because we play so deep, we don't have to have super talented secondary players. That's why we can take sixth-round rookies like Jordan Fuller and Darian Kendrick and integrate them into the defense relatively seamlessly because you don't have to be that guy who can go press the receiver and not make one false step and get beat because we're giving you that cushion to make your reads and keep the offense in front of you, play from the table, and come down. Just like in baseball, if a fly ball is hit to an outfielder, we always tell them you go back first. It's much easier to come in than to turn around and go back out. It's the exact same thing for these secondary players. It's so much easier to come forward and make a play than have to turn around and catch up and still make the play 20 yards further downfield. So here we've got our two high shell. Post snap, we've rotated to our cover three again except this time we rotated strong. So our strong safety has rotated down to play the strong hook. Jalen Ramsey here is essentially playing a weak side linebacker, a weak side inside linebacker position, what they would call the dime. And he is coming over to the weak hook. Our nickel defender is playing that curl to flat technique. Our true inside linebacker, Bobby Wagner, is responsible for the curl to flat out here. You can see him. Looking at the only threat left, the running back. Our weak safety is coming to play the middle third. Then our corners each have the deep third to their half of the field. So this would be a true cover three where we are rotating strong. What most would call three buzz. Get in on the action with prize picks. Simply pick two or more players and win up to 10x your money. Join over 1 million people who have found a better way to play. Download the app today and get your first deposit matched up to $100 using our promo code DTRAMS.